esteemed delegates. We are about to embark on a highly engaging session that focuses on the revival of electroconvulsive therapy and its current status. It is my privilege to invite Dr. Kavirayani Krishnamurti and Dr. Mopidewe Vijayagopal to chair this session. I am delighted to welcome Dr. B. N. Gangadhar, a distinguished psychiatrist and recipient of the prestigious Padma Shri Award, to the DS. Dr. Gangadhar will enlighten us with his expertise on ECT, discussing the latest breakthroughs in the field. Dr. Krishnamurti brings with him a wealth of experience in psychiatry. He has had the privilege of working in various medical colleges, teaching postgraduate students in Kerala, Karnataka AA, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and even Nepal. Currently, he is associated with Arundhati Institute of Medical Sciences in Gandhigul. Joining us as the co-chairperson is Dr. Vijay Gopal, who has made significant contributions during his tenure in Kakinara and Vizag. Presently, he serves as the professor and head of the psychiatry department at GSL Medical College in Rajamahendravaram. Dr. Vijay Gopal is also renowned for his literary skills. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our distinct honor to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. B. N. Gangadha. Dr. Gangadha is a highly accomplished psychiatrist and a prominent figure in the field of mental health. His remarkable qualifications and extensive experience have made him a leading authority in his field. Dr. Gangadha completed his MBBS degree in 1978 from Bangalore Medical College, followed by an MD in psychiatry from Namhans in 1981. He has received prestigious recognitions for his groundbreaking research work, including a Doctor of Science that is DSC from S. Yasa University in 2012 and another DSC from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences Bangalore in 2022. As a distinguished academician, Dr. Gangadha has made significant contributions to the field of mental health. He has been a Fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences since 2006 and a Fellow of the Academy of Sciences since 2019. His illustrious career includes several years of dedicated service at Nimhans, where he served as a faculty member since 1982 and held the position of Director from 2016 to 2020. He now holds the esteemed position of Professor Emeritus of Integrative Medicine. Dr. Bungada's outstanding contributions have been recognized through numerous prestigious awards, including Sir C. V. Raman and Sir Mokshikandam Vishweshwaraya Awards from Karnataka and the Padam Shri from the Central Government. He has also been appointed as the National Distinguished Scientist Chair by the Department of Ayush, Government of India. With a prolific research background, Dr. Gangadha has published over 445 indexed national and international scientific publications. His significant impact is evident through his impressive age index of 54. As a mentor and guide, he has played a vital role in shaping the careers of nearly 60 MD and PhD trainees. Dr. Gangadha's research areas primarily focus on the intersection of yoga and mental health. His pioneering work has shed light on the therapeutic potential of yoga in promoting mental well-being. Today he speaks on his ever-favorite subject of ECT. Thank you. Very often used, very much hated. First, specific. And... Uh, the most fascinating subject in psychiatry is history of Ever since Ceremonious Largus, the earliest 17th century Italian physician used a Mediterranean tarpedo fish for treatment of headache. It used to produce eight volts of color. And from then on, of course, we know from there how much we have evolved to use electroconvulsive therapy. And of course, that has its own peak, it has its own fall, and now it is. Neither even taken Professor B. N. Gangadha, who is the former director of Nance, and he is on the age where I am going to talk to say that. <laughs> and on the age where he came to be in the Nance, and I hand over the mic to him to, to sort of do the proceedings. And, 
function for many reasons because my own senior Dr. Kiridam Reddy is organizing this. I learned uh, psychiatry when he was my senior at Nimhans and of course there are many other relationships to many colleagues here in the Andhra Psychiatric Society uh, that makes me even more uh, emotional about participating in any academic activity that happens in uh, this part of this uh, country. For this uh, conference, as a part of the uh, lecture, I have chosen to speak on uh, ECT uh, related ethics and uh, regulations which we would have to mind when we are using it in clinical practice. So, uh, of course, I have been introduced, I thank the organizers for liberally introducing me. And what I would uh, go through in this uh, talk is something about the history, why ethics and regulations are important, what is the difference between standards and guidelines, accreditation, these are the terms that we get uh, confused, consent is a central issue related to ethics of GCD, and of course, what are the regulations uh, which are international and national, and what message that we take home at the end of this talk in terms of our practicing ECT as ethically as possible. But most, uh, uh, if you look back, in ECT for many of us may become very historical because many treatments have come after we have born here. Whereas ECT came much before we were all born. So that's the reason why ECT becomes a history and we perhaps have to know this. And uh, as part of the History of psychiatry, uh, Dr. Venkobra, who was known for his uh, thoughts on the history of psychiatry, uh, history of medicine in general though, uh, used to uh, give three stages of uh, growth in uh, psychiatric practice. One of course was in the 1600s when Philip Pennell removed the chains from these people and then the last century uh, we saw 1900s, we saw in the early half many uh, somatic therapies among which ECT is one of them. Others, uh, the malaria therapy, the surgical therapy, uh, although they received a Nobel Prize are now not used at all as you all know. And we have the later part of the last century uh, was surrounded by the pharmacological intervention, the drug therapies. So these three stages of growth in uh, uh, psychiatric evolution uh, we see and uh, that in the modern psychiatric evolution. Uh, although tomorrow we are going to be hearing about uh, several things that our traditions had talked about, mind, mental health and taking care of mental health. I will come to that little later. Uh, ECT has stood like a wall. Although many Newer pharmacological agents came through, and there were a lot of onslaughts on ECT, and uh, ECT went on building evidence. Uh, the therapeutic effects, nobody could dispute that ECT had substantial therapeutic effects, although the argument whether it is better than drugs, not better than drugs, is it required at all, etc., etc., is a different issue. The side effects, although most arguments came against it for reasons of side effects, again those proved to be perhaps negative. And ECT went on to become more and more refined from the day it was introduced. And so ECT has remained like a wall in our psychiatric treatment. Although some of our colleagues would recall that ECT is not as much used as we were using it when we were younger people in psychiatric circles. That is a different issue altogether. In the last 85 years, ECT has seen uh, many uh, revolutions, many changes. Uh, we have moved from unmodified ECT to modified ECT. Uh, we were giving ECT to any illnesses and now we have ECT to be given to some focused psychiatric conditions and sine wave ECT to pulse wave ECT and ECT stimulus, it is not just one knob you turn but you can calculate, decide, 
person to person what ECT dose that we need to give. And of course, we are not just giving the stimulus and keep in mind we are monitoring the physiological status of the individual and also the clinical status of the individual both by way of outcome and also neuropsychological and neuropsychological dimensions. And of course, we have started researching and we perhaps not have, may not have made great inroads but the mechanisms of ECT are at least we are trying to build some hypothesis into this. There are of course many opinions and views on ECT uh, uh, to the level of saying ECT uh, has died. There is no more ECT at all. It need not be used at all. Uh, not just in the earlier days when ECT was put under controversy, as recently as about 3-4 years back, uh, in the British Medical Journal, a debate happened and one of the debaters was saying ECT has to be stopped uh, from using in psychiatric practice. So, this uh, arguments have been going on even today and that is the reason why I chose to present on the ethics and concept of ECT because that would perhaps give a better image to ECT even things from others uh, ECT is being seen as a problem. Why did ECT come into a lot of uh, debate, controversy and so on? Uh, the very terminology of ECT, although electroconvulsive therapy in Italy, Italy was next to Germany and Germany they used electroshock behind them, uh, the electroshock therapy, that is the term. And of course, Germany in those days was linked to a lot of Nazi crimes and somehow this name electroshock was uh, very uh, pejorative in terms of uh, using it in clinical parlance. And so ECT, mentally, all of us got stuck with the fact that ECT was perhaps a criminal act. And uh, it uh, also was used on committed patients who were in the asylums and not a OP patient who walked in the ECT and then went back. It was all given to people who were in the closed doors of asylums and ECT was given there. And that was the place where they first introduced ECT as well. And there are so many socio-political pressures, uh, even as recently as about six, seven years back, I saw a news item uh, from another country where people were saying, stop ECT, banners were going on in front of one of the hospitals. There were a lot of side effects which were feared. Uh, in fact, from a level to saying that my memory is completely lost to the doctors can read my mind out is given. There was a lot of such uh, uh, unforeseen, unimaginary, uh, uh, imaginary thoughts about ECT side effects have been prevalent. And of course, media uh, uh, took a very important uh, role in terms of malign ECT, in terms of uh, creating a lot of stigma. We took ECT, so that was the way in which uh, people were viewed when ECT was given to them for psychiatric disorders. And of course, pharmacological agencies, agents when they came, which were of course substantially beneficial to the patients and it created a different uh, uh, era because the drugs would be effective and drugs did not work on you and you had to be given easily. That means you had a very bad illness, very bad brain, very bad mental state. So, ECD became even more stigmatized after the pharmacological era. And so, there are reasons, other reasons which went on happening. In the days when the ECD was introduced, it was misused, misused and overused in other psychiatric disorders. And uh, when people required ECD, they were forced to take ECD even though the person was not willing to give a consent, consent was uh, uh, pushed away, they gave ECT, maybe with good intention, but it was seen as patients were being forced. And in fact, there was also a legal system that was available, patient requires ECT and he is not consenting, a law or a review board will give an order that means he can be given. So it seemed as if it was a punishment that was dictated by a law agency and ECT began to be restricted in children. 
the children cannot be given. Uh, adults also can have some problem when the IGC, PCP. So this issue also came up. And there are some treatment guidelines, treatment guidelines which said ECT should be considered as a lost option. So this made ECT to be again malign. Uh, this is an official treatment guidelines which included Mr. Calder. ECT would be the last option in this condition. And of course, ECT people also described as being used as, as a restraint. Highly psychotic, highly excited. Uh, you cannot give them any antipsychotic drugs uh, uh, because he would not be controlled. And yet, ECT, he would be sedated, quiet for a couple of hours. Of, uh, maybe a day or so, and so ECT could be used as a, some sort of, a, I wouldn't say chemical restraint, some form of restraint which was induced by way of all these procedures that it happens. And of course, ECT was linked to the, his other cousins, ECT's other cousins like the lobotomy, malaria therapy, insulin shock therapy, all these things seemed very barbaric in those days. ECT still continues to get that the tag of uh, in court barbaric therapies. So all these issues came up and so official professional bodies had to write some standards to do ECT. ECT of course working is beneficial but if you have to lose that stigma you have to follow ECT practice the way it has to be practiced in a sound way and so guidelines and standards were to be developed. And although some guidelines were available by many professional bodies, uh, people were still thinking that ECD was not practiced as ethically as what to be done or as professionally as it has to be done. And so, the British, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists engaged a, two psychiatrists to review and audit the way in which ECG was going on and this happened in 1981, published in 1981 although it was uh, uh, ordered in 1979 and the picture was quite gloomy. In most places ECD was not practiced up to the standards and so they went on to give a, a series of recommendations saying that uh, we have to identify who requires ECD, you have to write why this person uh, ECT, right? the ECT is indicated, and ECT suit that should have three chambers, a preparatory a ECT suit and a recovery suit, oxygen, ventilators, a host of those things they wrote as standards which were not being followed but should be followed when ECT has to be given, including record keeping and so on and so forth. And ten years later, one of the authors undertook on the behest of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Look, what has happened after we gave these recommendations, are our colleagues following these recommendations at all or not? In fact, to be gratifying, a lot of improvement had happened. But this was limited to anesthesia colleagues and nurses who are managing the ECD services. Psychiatrists themselves were still not uh, very uh, conscientious about the ECT standards and uh, in fact the equipment they were using were still very old equipment and uh, the equipment were not calibrated and the values that were given in the equipment uh, were perhaps not very standard that were available uh, from the whatever research that has happened about the ECT stimulus. Stimulus dosing was very arbitrary depending upon which psychiatrist was using it in a case, same argument different uh, norms were being done, different levels were being set and this was not standardized and uh, of course uh, the given uh, an, an instrument in hospital X and hospital Y gave different uh, uh, stimulus standards that were possible, the highest to the lowest were different in one machine versus another machine. So the problem still existed but of course 1992 is almost 30 years ago and in the 30 years we have seen extraordinary progress in ECT that has happened and today I can boast that ECT practice in our country is perhaps very good in most centers. Uh, 
thanks to many of the psychiatry colleagues who have taken ECT uh, as a very serious matter and uh, have practicing have been practicing ECT with the highest order of standard that are possible. And this session, I'm only reminding many of us about the concerns and the ethics that are involved, more so in the light of the MSCA about which I'm sure you're going to be discussing in the later part of the day. So we talk of some terms called as guidelines, standards, audit, accreditation of city services, and regulations. As some terms can have some commonalities. I'm just trying to clarify these words, terms. Guidelines are those which are proposed by professional bodies, by senior psychiatrists, or by an authorized group of people who say that if you do these things, you will get the best results. It is not mandatory, it is not a rule though, but guidelines serve a clinician to have some track of using ECT or any treatment for that matter as predictably as possible. And these uh, need not necessarily give you a protection from ethics or from legal issues, but nonetheless, most people consider using guidelines has some form of immunity from legal issues. Uh, it is difficult to verify these things objectively. Not all guidelines are supported by evidence-based data, although guidelines are useful. For example, ECT in children uh, should be limited to uh, diagnostic conditions. This is some uh, condition, some guidelines that they have set, and you have to follow this guideline. Following this guideline is again a micro-guideline. I don't have to necessarily follow the guideline. But it is useful and wise to follow the guidelines. After that, a series of guidelines have come once the guidelines story started. The APA produced the guidelines as recently as about six, eight, nine years ago also. And um, guidelines are produced, uh, like for example, 1990, uh, 1975, a task force was set. There's a consensus conference that happened. In 1990, they produced a guideline. In 2001, they produced a revision of that guideline. Uh, NIMH consensus conference reports influenced the guidelines. The Royal College of Psychiatrists produced the guidelines. The Indian Psychiatric Society recently also produced these guidelines. Uh, and uh, this was prepared by uh, the colleague of mine, the demands in the Jagdish in Delhi. And of course, ECT comes as a description in treatment guidelines of many psychiatric disorders also. So there are two ways in which ECT has been given guidelines. How do you practice ECT itself? And when you are treating an illness, when you want to give ECT to those people. So ECT guidelines are now becoming quite prevalent and are available. For example, the Indian Psychiatric Society uh, amongst the many issues emphasizes consent and ethics and regulations very importantly in their guidelines. And of course, there are many other uh, issues on which the guidelines talk about, starting from anesthesia, the stimulus, monitoring, the clinical uh, and the neuropsychological monitoring and so on and so forth. Standards are those which are set by a given body. It could be a professional body or it could be a statutory body are expected to follow the standards, starting from licensing to having this equipment uh, with that label, the Bureau of Indian Standards we have heard and so on and so on. The, uh, there could be standards saying that you should have a certificate put up that every year the ECT machine has been calibrated, every year the boils uh, machine has been tested, following medicines have to be kept in the tray in the ECT room itself by itself. Or in America, there are some places ECT treating psychiatrist should have undergone a certificate or an accreditation course. Only then he is certified to give ECT. So like this, standards are prescribed and you are expected to follow the standards. And of course, the standards would have a good number of them which you need to follow. Uh, audit is verified whether a person is following the standards or not. So when you do the audit, you check whether how many standards that I have described uh, for accrediting this service under me, this ECT service is following or not. And so it helps continuous monitoring and also verify 
and giving the feedback to the physicians whether things are happening or not. So at the end of it, you accredit. Accredit ECD services, for example, an accreditation of ECD services has come in Britain, the EMTAS, what they say. Usually this accreditation process is voluntary. I may want to volunteer and get this accreditation certificate and you have been seeing the NAC certificate in the universities, the NEME certificate, the hospitals, and the NEMEL certificate in the laboratories. Although we do not have an accreditation procedure for ECD, maybe the Indian Psychiatric Society should move to the idea of accrediting ECD services through itself. The Indian Psychiatric Society can do it and any other requirements for this, of course, I'll be happy to provide them. Of course, the men will be happy to provide this. ECT accreditation services of UK among, in that one of my students actually is a lead person in designing uh, one of the uh, procedures for the ECT uh, accreditation activity. Then there was a special committee and then it went on to give a list of things. It is self-regulated. I go through the class and get myself registered and then get these standards passed and Year after year, in some places, every three years, every two years, every five years, uh, you go through whether you are following those things or not and get your accreditation certificate from the board. And while doing the accreditation, there are many levels, like you are saying, uh, you must have heard NAC plus plus A plus plus and so on. So, so you can have accredited if you have some minimum standards are passing, you get a minimum accreditation. And you are getting some minimum standards, all are passed, and you are doing some recommendatory standards which are preferable. Uh, we would aspirational uh, levels of standards which are prescribed. When you do that, it becomes type 2 or level 2 accreditation. And if you are able to get this accreditation at level 2, uh, year after year, or cycle after cycle, two, three cycles continuously, you have got it can get a level 3 certification which is supposed to be the highest and these things will help ECD service to service uh, to boast that we are following very high standards and accordingly of course there is a monetary benefit by getting this uh, certification they would of course get their monetary, monetary benefit because they can charge a little more for patients and so on and so forth. Of course none of them are followed if a person is not following any standards or not many standards as would be expected, a CD and certification will be different. So uh, you go on, uh, differ, not accredited and so on. So when it comes to why I gave this introduction, it's very important to understand when you are doing ECP, you should be aware of this. All these things for a clinical practice may not be directly seen as ethics and regulation related, but they all form the foundation of what you may have to practice. One of the books that was written by none other than Pink and Motosum, both are strongly protagonists of ECT. They wrote a book on ECT related ethics and thanks to my colleague Dr. Jagrisha who shared this book with me a few months ago on the basis of that I was able to prepare this talk. So, there are some principles which you need to keep in mind when you are following ethics, beneficence, non maleficence which is first taught in our forensic medicine all these days. Autonomy should be given to the patient and you don't be very paternalistic in taking a decision about ECT to a given individual. And of course, confidentiality that is fan received the ECT. That for whatever is the reason, there is some stigma and of course, confidentiality is required. And of course, the ECT time in a confusion and in the uh, influence of anesthesia, the patient may give some details which are not to be spoken to the family members. So the confidentiality is even more important. The ECT services would not be denied to individuals for reasons other than clinical purposes uh, or given other than clinical purposes. The justice has to be given. So whenever you have to uh, practice ECT, uh, it is a very important to balance between what is good outcome beneficence and non-maleficence, not to harm, not to produce any adverse effect. 
any adverse effects unintended only. No intended adverse effects have to happen. And to produce clinical benefits, I have to produce some adverse effects should not be the motto in our mind. And that's one of the philosophies that you need to practice. <coughs> take consent because you are giving an autonomy. You are also giving an autonomy to him that there are also alternatives that are available. And so, uh, and today, MSCA, we also have to keep in mind what did the advanced directive for this given individual say. So that you have to keep it in your mind, although the days when I was practicing ECT, this clause, perhaps not to think about it, but today MSCA demands that. Consent, uh, you have to keep in mind how well the consent was taken, whether the person was competent to understand and give the uh, consent, or was he giving a consent uh, which would be seen as irrational, or denying the consent also being seen as irrational. <coughs> the issue related to uh, who is the person who gave consent, you know, the, the patient is not competent, the, uh, the legal Guardian, the nominated representative was the person, uh, he did he give a job or not, and who was the nominated representative? These issues become important in the day. Consent has to be seen as some form of uh, not just one time you gave ECT and then ECTs you are going to give the succession. No way. You perhaps have to think whether the consent requires to be revisited given the individual was earlier was not in a position to give consent. An NR gave the consent, and now this person is able to understand, but I have to explain to him again once more. And of course, there's a point which somebody brought to me when I was reading and preparing the whole thing. Not giving ECT, not making this ECT services available in my psychiatric hospital, would it uh, tantamount to a lapse of service being provided to a deserving so this also perhaps we may have to debate, although at this point of time no position can be taken either by me or by the Indian society or by the state or even by the MHCA for that matter. So I am aware when I am talking of consent, uh, the patient should be aware that this illness was requiring ECT and uh, I do understand the pros and cons of a given treatment, for example ECT here that I am, I should be able to understand that I have the right to accept or reject this uh, ECT as a treatment to me. I know that I can retract, even if I have given the consent, I can retract this consent at any time. I should be able to understand this concept also. And of course, I must also know that when the ECT was described to me, it was not the last option as was described in some guidelines. I had other alternatives as well that the ECT, I should be aware. And so, on that count, I have given my consent. And of course, whatever consent I gave is on my will, I was not required to give this uh, consent. So, these are the principles one has to follow. And you have to keep in mind whether how good was this insight uh, to the given individual about the ECT procedure itself. Uh, we generally use the word insight in the context of a diagnosis of a psychotic illness. Here, a illness is no measure of presence of insight to receive ECT or not. And it's a diagnosis itself is not a sole indicator to decide whether he can consent or he cannot consent. Or he should get ECT or he should not get ECT. You should not be guided by the label of the diagnosis. That is the message that I want you to take home. Uh, it is important that he has to acknowledge the presence of uh, the illness, uh, 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 not just a symptom. So, it's the overall condition for which we are going to begin ECT, not because we are just suffering from a given symptom for which I am describing ECT. And illness requires treatment as suggested. The treatment will include a host of preparation, etc., etc. The whole uh, concept of ECT need to know. And the doctor who is taking consent from him, he is the one who is going to give me the ECT. I think he has come to see me to take my consent for ECT. So it is not that he is some agent who is coming and receiving 
consent from me. That should not be the message that the person should get. And this treatment is a recognized treatment. It is not a fictional treatment. It is not an esoteric treatment. It is not that it is available only with him and not with anybody else. But I think you should, the patient should know that this is a generic treatment available anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world for that matter. I also should know the procedures that include anesthesia, uh, consciousness loss, application of electric current, and then the seizure, which are being monitored and so on and so forth. The whole thing, and of course, like I said, the whole procedure he needs to understand the work in the easy. The, he should know that it works for this condition for which I have been asked to take ECT. And not taking ECT may be worse than uh, take the illness itself. So I better take ECT. That concept I think he should understand. Although, of course, he may decide that illness is okay. I'm happy with the illness I'll get. Uh, and ECT today is the best option as far as this person is concerned. And though there are some alternatives, ECT is still the better alternative as suggested by the doctor. It is some message that need to go to him. And there are, of course, side effects of ECT. No treatment is without any side effect. And any side effect is an unintended uh, phenomenon that can happen, albeit rare in most situations. But then there are some commoner ones which can happen, but some rare ones also can happen. Commoner ones like headaches and body aches, you know. But there are some serious side effects which can happen, including some related to anesthesia. Even though these are serious, but they are very rare and there is some message that he needs to take home before he the person may be incompetent because of psychiatric illness and he is not able to decide whether he can vegetative individuals, ectonic individuals, individuals who have been sedated continuously because they are disturbed and not able to give uh, and understand the consent procedures. And uh, there could be some very irrational ways in which uh, the, he says no to the people. Everything he understands, but the one irrational thought about ECT itself he may be harboring. By giving ECT, uh, this fellow will extract everything in my brain, including my passwords, the bank account, and so on and so forth. He may think so. And if he is going to give these reasons, we know that these reasons are based on some irrational understanding of the ECT procedure itself or whatever may be the reason he has learned. Yes, of course, there could be some ways in which he gives his ECT consent, but he says, because I am guilty, I am depressed, ECT is the only way in which I can atone my guilt, it's a punishment, I deserve it. And that would also be an irrational way of giving ECT consent. And actually, the person is not actually giving consent. He has not understood the whole procedure for that. And he says, he goes on delaying any time, any time, I can't decide. I know delay could mean disease continues and there could be some risks about the disease itself. And he may decide, whoever is in the ward, okay, this nurse can decide. If she, whatever they decide, I will take. Again, in a very rational, what would be seen as not very responsible way of taking a consent. And there has to be today, the role of the review board, which may have to come into picture, although currently a legal representative of the individual, a particular representative, whoever with the individual, can give consent as called as a proxy consent. In the event this person is not in a position to give consent, if the person is in a position to give consent, he or she only has to give the consent. Whether there are situations where a second opinion is required, he is able to give consent, but he has been irrational. The understanding is poor, so somebody else has to explain to you. A second opinion has to be taken, is another issue which we need to debate on. And of course, regulations came. Because of all these confusions, uh, regulations came. In fact, it began with one person filing a case that uh, I should not be made to uh, give ECT, to receive ECT, and it went on. And I courts produced some rules, you have to follow these rules. and. One after the other, even different states, different countries started for, for making rules and regulations for ECT. And uh, whether these uh, uh, regulations actually made life worse for psychiatrists, made life worse for the patient, is an issue which has been continuously debated. And in fact, uh, it, oh, the general opinion from psychiatrists was because of these legal restrictions, we are not able to reach 
the treatment timely to the given individual. Uh, and in fact, one of the very senior authors who wrote about ECT in depression was one time said there are no more regulations required on ECT in practice. And uh, not just in America and such countries, in other countries also people realize that regulations made the role of a psychiatrist very restricted in clinical applications for a human being. <coughs> Sorry, I'm last few slides have already completed my term. Uh, for incapacitated patients, again, this, this issue of the legal matters came up and he was incapacitated, he couldn't give ECD. And one of the patient's uh, testimonial, uh, which we have read in one of the journals, is that you, doctor, I knew that you were asking me, I wasn't in a position to tell you, uh, but I since I was mute, I did not respond, you did not give me ECT, you kept giving me some other medicines and treatment. And when I started getting better, when I gave consent, that time you gave me ECT. So this sort of a, what we may call paradoxical issues came up. The regulations also made that a given ECT machine should not give more than X amount of stimulus to the individual. And so much so, uh, this made uh, uh, ECT machines uh, not very efficient, 5 to 6 percent of ECT patients, even with the maximum dose given by that ECT mission, were not in the position to converse. And so, this clause is another restriction in ECT practice as well. And uh, now comes the Mental Health uh, uh, Care Act in our country, which also brings ECT into its fold, says ECT should be only modified by the chief, that was the right thing that they did. ECT while being given to the children, you have to be doubly careful. Under 18, it should not be given. So this sort of restrictions have uh, come to India as well and we probably going to hear more about uh, the uh, uh, issues where the MSCA, the pros and cons of it. The pros, according to me, is the unmodified ECT was removed, which I think is a good thing that has happened. Uh, <coughs> lastly, uh, of course, these are the things that have been done in the uh, MHCA. ECD should not be given to minors and ECD should not be given without mother relaxants. And uh, only modified ECD have to be given under ideal in special permission uh, by the family and perhaps a review board uh, if required has to be chosen to a nominated representative can give consent. ECD should not be used as an emergency under section 74. ECT as a daycare only in, uh, uh, is also been described uh, in, uh, to be given only in uh, mental health establishment where they have already taken license. This issue is being discussed but again not very uh, well accepted at this point of time. And there has been an argument that has also been aired in one of the journals whether uh, are we making, uh, the, is the law making the ECT very restrictive instead of that can a hospital declare that this is the level at which we are following ECT. I am giving that modified ECT, I declare and if the person wants to still take ECT, he should be able to take the ECT. So this levels of level 1, level 2, level 3 could also include uh, uh, at the level 3 highest level when all these things are followed, level 1 unmodified is still being given. Is it possible to have that degree of freedom to the patients to choose what is the degree of sophistication of the city that they need or not? Is there another issue that is being debated? Uh, uh, advanced directive is one other issue which I uh, have found it very useful. Uh, some of the clinicians are already talking, and I am sure some of you will also be practicing. At the name of discharge, <laughs> you describe everything to the individual and prepare the individual with the help of the family members and other legal representatives explain everything and so he will give a consent when I have to get treatment for the illness again, I am giving consent to following treatment X, Y, Z, close up in ECT or whatever. So he gives, understands, makes a advanced uh, directive, well informed in the presence of psychiatrists or psychiatrists, family members, so that this is available to the treating psychiatrist well in advance because we know 
many psychiatric treatments are falling and they keep coming again and again. But psychiatric treatment at that time, you don't have to necessarily worry. And in fact, this proactive way of using advanced directive, something I have found it very, very useful. I'm sure tomorrow you're going to be discussing about this. So, uh, always take informed consent, involve your family member, and those who are not able to understand, uh, make sure that you require or take a, a review board's uh, permission as well. And uh, for those people who understand ECD but they don't want to give ECD, I do not want to give ECD. And rarely whether I should use the MHRB to convince or give an uh, order that I can go ahead and give ECD to the individuals. Please note, involuntary admission does not make it obligatory for a patient to receive ECD. And this is a very important thing that we all have to remember. And so, when ECT has been put under so many regulations, why not some medicines? This is a question that one of my very senior person, colleague, asked me. Uh, close up with reduces so many adverse effects. No regulations are made. Only guidelines and standards are available. Ketamine, neuroleptics, SSRIs, they also produce quite lethal uh, side effects for some times for the people. These issues, why they have not been brought under, why only ECT has brought under so many conditions, ethics, regulations, etc., etc. So, this debate apart, I will stop here summarizing. Uh, ECT has to be used judiciously. I told about uh, uh, what it is to take consent very optimally and not in all individuals. You have to be well informed about the developments in ECT before practicing ECT. ECT updates, ECT CABs are something that are useful for you to gain this knowledge. Uh, you have to follow the regulations and guidelines if there are any available from the professional body, for example, the Indian Psychiatric Society. IPS guidelines and the MNCA would be a useful way of practicing ECT in your clinical practice. <coughs> Being ethical helps not just yourself but also the patient and outcome is also going to be very helpful when you are most ethical. Consent is a must and reviewing consent periodically is something that you have to make a policy from clinic to clinic. And MSCA is something that we need to remind ourselves and uh, the review board where required has to be used for children. So with this, uh, apologies for having rushed through in the last few slides. I Profusely thank Goddess Saraswati for giving me all this wisdom to be able to share with you. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Jagadish Tirthahandi, helped me in preparing many of these slides. And he gave me this book, which is coming out very handy in terms of preparing uh, this particular talk. I thank each one of you for listening to me. And also, of course, thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference uh, to share this point. This is my email. If there are any questions, and if we are all very hungry, we have to move to the lunch. Please uh, feel free to send questions on this email. We'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gangan, for the irritating explanation of everything since then. With these hands, late 1980s, I have given 60, 60 straight ECPs in a single year. The process of others and I think that's why. Yamadar Maharaj Kolu and Akhans is shown in the book. Why? Because I have ethics and follow the reason why I have said Papa and Akhans is shown in the book. Why? 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 So what I am telling is, there people used to be brought as if the cattle are brought for sacrifice. And he says, no, 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 that is his duty. That's what the situation, from there we have evolved to this extent that we have to apply the things in ECT. Look, our patient actually, we were giving him candle of our patient, he said, he straight ECT. He was brought, suddenly he cried out to the government. Saying that if you promise you won't give ECT, I'm not going to ECT. No, I mean, how people wanted to escape it. Now here is the inform concern, review concern, everything. Sir, we just take this can be. That's why I said it's good and right. So, we have a, uh, we have a question of this, huh? and I have, and I have three questions. Not more, more than three questions to be discussed with Professor Gangala during our afternoon.
So I invite any questions or brief comments. Thank you. And first, so we take up all the conduct the proceedings about question answer and give you the concluding remarks. Okay, the mic, mic is on the floor. Another thing. The how the court 
Now the court can order psychiatrists don't give direct decisions. Only modified decisions should be given. I don't know. Is it the... I, I, I am ignorant about the, what is the advice given by the great uh, IPS and uh, other uh, task forces. Uh, probably if we say modified ECT will be better, give the less side effects than direct ECT and all such things. Court can, how, the, how a court can take a decision in such, such things, that is one thing. So probably uh, we should not follow in India at least to help the lot of poor patients and other people. The so-called best and other things, we should have to be much fearful. Probably the uh, national leaders should think about these things and somewhere moderate uh, situation, not the two extremes, should be uh, taken. As Dr. Ravishankar is saying, it is true that many patients say, Doctor, uh, even though you try with many drugs, I will not get relieved. That is my past experience. You give me a CT, I will get relief with that. Like that, you will know, senior doctors uh, know that such uh, experience of the patients. And Dr. Prasad Ravan to ask one question. Word authority on ECT and uh, your lecture today clearly gives, but I, I just want to share, it's not a question, but ECT is still used regularly. If some centers are not using, they are having some problems. And it is the mentoring by the teachers to the students, which I see very commonly. In our Asha hospital, daily about 30 to 40 ECT still continue. And people do come for maintenance. And my own um, experience over, it's our own kind of insecurity about A treatment sometimes determines what we talk to the patient and the family. Second, the law has clearly said in mental health uh, care bill that you don't give for adolescent without this. That's the law. I mean, this is a law formed by the parliament. But in that case, there is this, we have a huge system. We write to the mental health board. So there is no nothing to fear as long as you follow the protocol. Only thing is, I think, once you are doing a ECT for less than 18 years, you send a mail to the board, that it's a district board, and then there will be a response. And it's an email only, you don't need to wait. In fact, it's only information. That is one. The last part of it is, I still think ECT is like Ramavan in certain conditions. But it's not for using in judiciary, and that's what Gangadhar brought up quite well. Thank you very much. I request Dr. Gangadhar to say some concluding remarks. Modified ECT or unmodified ECT is not a court order. It is a state order. It is an act. So whether the act has become paternalistic to the patients or they have seen we were paternalistic is another argument altogether. And it has been introduced. That is a different issue altogether. But for some reason or other, World over, they are giving up unmodified ECT. <coughs> but the point very well taken, person should have a freedom to receive unmodified or not. He should exercise, he patient should exercise, the family should exercise, whether I have to go by a Volvo bus or a regular uh, auto rickshaw. That is the decision that he has to make. We are now saying that everybody has to go only by Volvo bus, even if he is one passenger. So that is the unmodified ECT. Although the destination is safe, uh, maybe some body aches, maybe more or maybe etc. But nothing more. Uh, the fact remains it is as safe. Uh, but this is very difficult to debate. When the act was being formed, I am sure all of us as academic colleagues were participative. How much we influence the act in making bodies is another issue. But of course, any act made by humans can always be uh, Disenacted at some point of time, that we will see whether it is possible. Thank you, sir, Professor Gangadhar. And then, as we are running short of time, uh, we we say that the session is concluding. And then, any questions you can ask. So I hand over the microphone back to the audience. Thank you very much.